All right, let's get it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. All right, in the bullpen today, we have Matt Laszlo, congressional correspondent, Ross Story, also based on Capitol Hill, veteran journalist, been covering campaigns in every aspect since 2006, Wired Magazine contributor, and he has a long list of significant accomplishments. Matt, good to have you on the show. How are you? Oh, hey, I live in Washington and I cover Congress, so I'm miserable, but right. uh, besides that, Life's good. <laughs> well, let me make your life a little more miserable. Um, you did a story about Donald Trump and obviously this kind of, I guess, new normal that he's bringing to politics. He literally, in my opinion, took over the Republican Party in order to get them to pay his legal bills that are going to be uh, really astronomical. Uh, and is there a reluctancy inside of the Republican Party? Uh, meaning donors, those that contribute and make the machine run to pay his legal bills, or or are we seeing a disconnect between the major donors of the party uh, and this whole apparatus to make everything about MAGA and not a Republican governor, not Republican senators, not Republican House members? How do you see it in your reporting? Well, so it, it, when we look at today's Congress. This is a, you know, upper crust. Like these are multi, multi millionaires, most yep. members of Congress. And so when it comes to that quote unquote donor class, you look at some of these Republican senators, they're sitting on 300 million, 100 million, 40 million dollars. And when I personally asked them, hey, you know, Trump's looking to the GOP base to help fund his legal troubles. Are you going to help pony up for your guy? And they're like, no, 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 don't look at me. <laughs> but <laughs> they're in that same breath, they're fine with him raising money off the GOP base. And if you go back to the January 6th committee, they said that what? Trump raised about 250 million off the GOP's base. And like the folks that he's raising this money off of, they're not wealthy. And so right. they might be giving five bucks here, 10 bucks here, just because they believe in him and they're like, oh, you know, they feel like they're a part of this movement. But then you got these wealthy people who are kind of riding the tides with Trump and they're not ponying up. So it's, yeah, there's a disconnect between the elites in the party and yep. the base base. Let me, let me say this because I find it quite interesting. So members of Congress, and as you pointed out, many of them are loaded. They are independently wealthy uh, and they have access to significant capital. So they're saying they're not going to participate in the scheme or the scam, depending on how you see it. Uh, but they are okay with Trump and his cronies promoting the scam for others to participate in. And I find it interesting because normally a person in Trump's position would be a great fundraising apparatus by proxy to the entire party, meaning they bring more money in. They are campaigning on behalf of other people, they can help fund campaigns directly. But Trump has a completely different style, I would say, in his political reality. Well, and Trump has been a prolific fundraiser, and but he's turned off the backs of these mom and pop folks who are, you know, the base of the party, not the wealthy. And that's where it's interesting kind of watching these dynamics, because while all these Republicans on Capitol Hill, when I first approached them about this, you know, any question with Trump, they get a little either deers in the headlight or they get a little infatuation, you know, because yeah. he's either their guy, their guy, or they're terrified of him. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to me watching them kind of throw their own voters under the bus and saying, yeah, 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 he can scoop up all your money, but no. Personally, I'm not going to open up my checkbook. And now a couple of them did leave that door open like, oh, yeah, we might fund him. But one of those guys is Senator Ricketts from Nebraska, you know, Republican. I'm from Chicago. His family owns my Chicago Cubs. And so they're sitting on billions and billions. He personally is only sitting on like, what, tens of millions, which is astronomical for this reporter to even think about. But so he left the door open for his family, which is this huge mega donor family 
So yeah, maybe cut their checks, but that's going to be all that hack stuff that, you know, just floods your TV, that makes you nauseous, that makes us all nauseous. And that's where really seeing these Republicans just being terrified of Trump, where they know that the party needs that money. And now that he's kind of taken over the RNC, or pardon me, not kind of, right. now that him not and his reckless. family yeah. with Larry Trump, now that they've taken over the RNC, what did he do? Cut 60 staffers that first weekend. And then now all that money, he's steering towards his legal funds. And Republicans on Capitol Hill are saying, oh, no, no, it's a political witch hunt. Biden's going after him. So he should be able to use donor money for that. But then when you get him in the quiet of the Capitol, when no cameras around, no mics around, they know when they admit that that is bad for the party and going to have lasting impact for decades on the Republican Party. But you know, Matt, it's kind of like a cult where the cult leader typically, they know they're a con artist, right? The guy in charge knows he's a con. And the people part of the executive team, they realize the whole thing is a con. Um, they're not going to drink the Kool-Aid. If yeah. the head guy says drink the Kool-Aid, the executive team, they're not drinking the Kool-Aid because they know this guy is not the real deal. But they're willing to let you drink the Kool-Aid. They're willing to let you give your last. They're willing to allow a scheme where uh, you are a monthly contributor. Uh, but you're on a fixed income. They don't care about that whatsoever. And let me ask you this question, Matt, because you've been doing this for a long time. And I know that the political reality is that many elected officials are feckless leaders, regardless of party affiliation. Many of them uh, provide little to no leadership on things that actually matter to people. But have you seen something like this before inside of a political party where literally the vast majority of individuals are completely terrified to stand up for the people who gave them power in the first place. No, I and I read a lot of history on the side. Like I can't think of any parallels. If anything, when we saw the Democratic Party go through, you know, that internal party, uh, you know, the family bickering back in 2016, when it was, you know, the Bernie Sanders folks who Hillary really needed to bring into the party, but they were so. Um, they didn't like what Debbie Wasserman Schultz had done to the DNC. And so if anything, that was this anti-establishment feeling from the party base. If anything, that's kind of flipped on its head here. Because yeah. here you have those elites kind of being pushed out so that the trucker cap folks can go in. But then you look and you're like, wait, the guy who's doing the trucker caps and the guy who's got the uh, pumped up kicks that he's selling for three, four hundred bucks a pop. Wait, isn't he supposed to be this billionaire? You know, mm -hmm. and so that's where it, Trump is rewriting or Republican. Let me put it back on them. The Republican political class is allowing him to rewrite all the rules as he goes. And again, when you talk to someone like Mitt Romney, who many of Trump's base say, "Oh, he's a never Trumper. Oh, he's not a Republican anymore." No, what Mitt Romney tells us is. He still loves the Republican Party. He loves conservatism. So he's going to stay in the party. But he's like, guys, this guy is ruining our party. And that's what no one else on Capitol Hill really seems to be willing to say out loud, even though you know they know it. Yeah, they know what's happening, Matt. And here's the thing. There's no Republican Party anymore. There's no Republican Party. When yeah. Donald Trump Jr. came out and said, there's no Republican Party, all you have is MAGA now. Okay, he said it. I've been saying it for two years. The first day I said it on my radio program, I had conservatives galore call my show and tell me how I was off my rocker, how I was completely wrong, how Donald Trump loves the Republican Party, he just wants to make it better. His son comes out, says there's no Republican Party anymore, it's only MAGA. They celebrate that ideology. And you have people who support Trump who openly say they are trying to get rid of democracy. Are there some members of Congress right now currently serving? Who are down with their plan? Oh yeah, and that's that's been the hard part. When, because what I've covered Congress since 2006, I've seen a lot of government shutdowns. I've spent a lot of Christmases at the Capitol alone. The lawmakers they still get to fly home and then come mm -hmm. back. Yep, I'm there alone with the other reporters, and so <laughs> none of us could have expected that House Republicans wouldn't just they didn't shut. 
the government down, they shut Congress down for three weeks last year. You know, when they ousted Speaker McCarthy yep. and then went and ended up having to settle for Speaker Johnson, which many Republicans say they settled on him. It, yeah, they're rewriting the rules and that chaos, like for the Capitol itself, the body most representative of you, the American people, for that to be shut down for three weeks, many Republicans were telling us, oh, we're fine with that. You know, this was a part of what we ran on. And then after three or so weeks of chaos, you had the old dogs in the party saying, no, 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 we have to look better than this because we got to be reelected in 2024. And so, no, like a part of their agenda, like, you hear the rhetoric aimed at, oh, we want to unwind deep state. Oh, you know, we want to go after the bureaucracy and, uh, you know, the bloated federal government. And you really need to push these people and really listen to what they say and believe them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, I believe them. And when they, they really want to dismantle things. And yeah. they've been pretty successful at it. Uh, very successful at attacking the vulnerabilities of any democracy, uh, in my opinion. Um, here's the thing, man. There's this saying, basically, that from chaos comes order. But the reality is, is manufactured chaos. And from that manufactured chaos, anything that seems orderly becomes a very welcomed ideological approach. And I believe that part of Trump's strategy is to create chaos. And he comes with his brand of order making it seem like order, but really it's just a little bit less chaotic because of some of the hierarchical rules. Uh, for example, when there was a bipartisan deal uh, for border security, he literally said, don't sign it. He told Republicans, don't do that because he wants the chaos to remain for him to be the in-demand order. Now, what uh, do you say to that? Yeah, no, it's so true. And if anything with Trump, I mean, and more than that, well, you know, I'm a professor at Johns Hopkins where I teach on new media and all that. Like, I gotta give it to the guy. He's a master communicator. Now, a lot of us might disagree with what he's communicating, but since he came down that um, escalator in uh, New York in 2016, the focus has been on him. And that's where he's this pop, he's the poppiest politician of pop politicians. But so he doesn't care about policy per se. Like right. what he did yesterday on abortion. He's like just trying to have it always. Like, hey, look at me. I'm the one who undid Roe v. Wade. But hey, I still want your votes if you uh, care about women's rights and all these red states. And so like he gets it and he just wants to kind of make that last anchor he's talking to, that last politician he's talking to, that last group he's talking to. He wants to just make them happy, it seems. And so that's where I look a little bit deeper. It's like, all right, who's his brain trust? So when it comes to someone like Steve Bannon, oh, you know, he's been sharpening his knives for years. And now mm -hmm. he sees that he can co opt Trump. Now, he would never say that to Trump's face, but he just allows his thinking on unwinding uh, the bureaucracy and going after, you know, unwinding what they call the administrative state. Um, here in DC, the administrative state's a lot of my neighbors. You know, the administrative state might be that person or is that person wearing that big hat at Yellowstone who's helping you and your family avoid that grizzly bear, you know? And so they've really been able to co-opt him, even though that's kind of simultaneously allowed him to co-opt the party. Yep. And so I don't really see if that party knows who's in control. And that's why we really need to keep an eye on who Trump's hiring uh, right. and who's he firing. That's right. Very well said. Um, on that note, I encourage people to read this um, amazing breakdown. Tell people how they can follow you, get access to your great work at Raw Story. Um, at Matt Laszlo on the X, I guess, these days, on the right. former tweets. Um, but yeah, I'm at Raw Story, also contributor at Wired. Um, and yeah, on Instagram, all that stuff. Don't spend so much time on social media unless you're following me. There you go. I like that. That's a great closing line. Brother, we're going to have you back. We appreciate the work you continue to do. Keep people honest, okay? Appreciate you. Absolutely.